Hello, and welcome to the Project Good podcast. I'm your host, Anne-Marie Hilton. Project Good is a social impact podcast interviewing experts and advocates about the pressing problems that we face globally and hearing how they suggest we move forward in the future. The Project Good podcast is brought to you by Project Good Work. The goal of this podcast is to inspire people and organizations to develop a mindset that can move others to positive action regarding the complex social issues facing people on the planet. For June, we're focusing on the crisis of masculinity and fatherhood. Today, I have the pleasure of interviewing Derek David Bryant, children's entertainer, author, speaker, and fatherhood advocate. Mr. Bryant is a devoted husband, father, and entrepreneur. He's a noted fatherhood advocate and works as a fatherhood engagement coordinator with Community Action of Central Texas. Mr. Bryant has traveled the nation encouraging fathers and families. He's the author of the books, And David Danced with All His Might, and My Father Works Hard. Let's get into the interview. First, let me introduce our guest, Derek David Bryant, fatherhood advocate, author, and speaker. Mr. Bryant has spent over 15 years helping families reach their full potential by encouraging the involvement of fathers in their families. Mr. Bryant's company, Bryant Enterprises, offers support groups, training, and resources to support men who want to develop their skills and knowledge as fathers. Mr. Bryant works to show that with a bit of guidance, most men can grow to be awesome fathers. Welcome, Derek. Thank you. Um, so before we get into the questions, uh, what inspired you to get involved with helping young men become better fathers? Well, I uh, got started just, you know, I have a love for working with children. I believe children are, they're, they're amazing. Like Whitney Houston said, you know, I believe the children are our future. And so no one impacts our children like our parents and more particularly our fathers. And so I am very passionate about men being men and fathers standing up and, and being what the children need them for it to be. So uh, in working with children, I want to make sure that we're impacting those who influence our children. And that's what led me to uh, have really a passion about working with men. Okay, great. Um, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think uh, since we had this uh, 2020 pandemic, it's really changed the perspective um, of life. And also, um, obviously, since a lot of parents had to uh, do a combination of work and school and everything at home, it really started highlighting how important parents are. So um, this is definitely timely. And to have someone um, that is uh, focused on that is uh, wonderful. Um, so uh, one of the things that um, I've been uh, researching and talking to a lot of people about, and also um, it's been in the news um, before, is that uh, a lot of people feel that masculinity is in trouble today. Um, do you think that masculinity is in trouble today? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I feel, you know, I feel that it is in trouble today just because, you know, um, what is being put out there in the media, through our music, through print news and so forth, um, I'm a believer of, you know, you shall become what you hold, what you behold. So um, many, the, the, many of the men, like the, the themes and the music is, is negative. Uh, things that we see on TV from even the music like hip hop to country to rock uh, is glorifying the, the selfishness, the false images of mas mas masculinity. So uh, also about drugs and, and getting money and, and the pimp culture. Hey, I want to be a pimp, that kind of thing. And so, um, if these young men, young boys grow up seeing a skewed image of what manhood is, then it translates to our society, to our culture. And then we grow up, uh, rather than being on target, we grow up off target, off with a misconception of what masculinity is. So I believe there is uh, that masculinity in general is in trouble. Okay. What would you define as healthy masculinity? Um, healthy masculinity, I feel, is... A, a man who understands who he is, a man who understands his assignment. Uh, for example, you know, as, as men, it's important that we take care of ourselves. And so when we understand our assignment as men and what that is, we also understand that, look, if we love our family, we need to be around as long as possible to be the best that we can be. And sometimes that, that means taking care of us. You know, it's like the old adage, if a, if a plane is going down, 
and, and you know, on a, on a plane and the, the, the oxygen mask, the, it comes down. You want to make sure that you take care of yourself first. So then you can turn to your neighbor, your child, your wife, your partner and help them. And so when we uh, as men are able to realize one, might have stressors in life. And so we have to deal with that. We have to make sure that we're healthy, eating, eating right, making sure that we're dealing with our emotions, the trauma that goes on with just being a man in general, being a father in general. A lot of times we push that aside and we, we push it down. It's like, stuff it down, stuff it down, way down, right? And we're taught real men don't cry, real men don't deal with emotions. A healthy masculinity, we, we understand this. We understand I need to process some things so I can be healthy, so I can deal with these emotions, so I can be the best version of me that I can be for my children, for my, for my family, and for my community. I guess one of the questions, as you were mentioning, um, you talk about emotions. One of the biggest things right now um, with everything that's going on in society, um, obviously, I'm sure you've noticed there's the big uh, feminist push. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's the, uh, uh, along with the big feminist push, there's this, um, I guess, for lack of uh, better terms, kind of uh, being kind of uh, neutral, um, neutral in terms of uh, gender, neutral in terms of like, you know, how you should process emotions. Um, and so, you know, one of the, the things that I think that I've seen um, is that there's this uh, confusion factor um, of, you know, what you're supposed to be like necessarily, um, you know, maybe you come out as a man or a woman, but now society has put you into, I guess, this setting of neutral, like you, like even picking a, a, a side has become, um, you know, uh, uh, problematic. And so where, I guess, are men supposed to uh, lean to, or how do they, how do they deal with all of these, um, uh, new kind of, um, I guess, definitions of what it is to be a man. Um, I guess, who do they, how should they, um, how should they uh, deal with these things or who, who should they lean on in order to start defining who they are as a man? Uh, very good question. I, I think, you know, a lot of times in our society, we, we tend to try to be so political, politically correct that we often err and um, we try to please everybody until we're not really defining who we are uh, and, and not accepting, you know, the, the, these gender roles that we've had since God created Adam and Eve. And so uh, some things that I feel are people we can turn to, one is our father, you know, our, our, the, the father that we had. Now, everyone has a father, whether dad was there or not. You have a father, whether you knew your father or not, you still have a father. And so as men, we tend to want to look back in, into one saying, I want to be just like my daddy or two. You know what? I don't want to be like him because he was no good. Or maybe even mm -hmm. I don't know who he is. So wanting to look at our father to kind of say, tell me who I am. Who is my father? Where, where's my identity? Identity. Where does my identity lie? And so we look to our father to get that affirmation. And when dad's not there or maybe dad, he doesn't give it. Why? Because his dad didn't give it to him. And then his dad didn't give it to him. And it's the cycle of having these men step into manhood when they don't even know what manhood looks like. And so it's important that as a society that we affirm, yes, it is okay to be a man. It is okay to be a woman. These are the roles. This is biologically, this is who I was born to be. And so knowing what that looks like and then seeing, OK, what is manhood uh, and what is how is that demonstrated? What is the correct example? For example, you know, even in my, my own my own family, my dad is, is an amazing father. You know, growing up, he was what I would call he was um, there. But in some instances, he was absent. He was physically there, but emotionally absent. Why? Because his his dad was the same way. Uh, my grandfather was was raised by a pimp in the streets of Chicago, Illinois. That was kind of his mentor. So imagine my father being raised by someone who was raised by a pimp. He didn't get all the warmth that maybe my father should have got. He didn't, they didn't have those talks about puberty, about sex, about just being a decent man. You know, my, my grandfather did what he needed to do. He did his best. And in turn, my father did his best. But when you're looking at 
that tell me who I am. A lot of times fathers and men are trying to be the best that they can be. But at some point, we have to break the cycle. So we look at the good and the bad. And when you focus on the gender neutrality, it's like, okay, no, for I am a male by birth, and I'm choosing who I need to be based off what my family has taught me. And so I, to answer your question, I think we, we look at our fathers or our surrogate fathers, the substitute fathers, the pastors, the coaches, even like men I grew up watching on TV and uh, Heathcliff, Heathcliff Huxtable, Bill Cosby, mm -hmm. right? These, these role models that we try to emulate. So that's what, what I think that we can find our, our norm in and our ident identity is going back to the father. Okay. Um, I guess one of the things that comes up um, now, uh, I'm going to do kind of a two part question for you. Sure. Um, one going kind of, uh, you know, be the devil's advocate and then one be the, you know, uh, the angel kind of. Um, so right now, the, the biggest complaint in society or, well, I guess uh, there's a lot of big complaints, but um, when it comes to this topic um, is about toxic masculinity. Um, you know, what would you say would be considered toxic masculinity? Uh, to toxic masculinity is, that I would say, maybe traits or characteristics that are poisonous to the idea of what a man should be. And so as we walk out these ideas, some examples could be, you know, that men think women are no good except for sex. You know, our women are sex objects. That is an erroneous line of thinking. That is toxic. You know, children you might think about our kids. Hey, children are meant to be seen, not heard. I understand the concept, but that is also toxic as well. You know, things like it's okay to, to abuse my wife or kids, they're my property. Again, toxic. You know, this machismo, macho attitude, toxic. Uh, it's okay to drink every night until I pass out drunk, toxic. It's okay for men to, to, to be involved in pornography and all this stuff, toxic ideas. And so, when I define toxic masculinity, it's these traits, this idea, uh, the characteristics that are poisonous to a man and those around him. Those around him could be his his his, his wife, his children, or those who he has a relationship with. Because sometimes people are watching on the outside. It might be the, the next door neighbor who doesn't have a father. Yet he's watching this dad who's with his family. And because he watches his father, he thinks that's what manhood, manhood looks like when he's watching toxic man uh, uh, walk out these characteristics. So that's what I, I would say is poisonous ideas and, and traits about manhood. Okay. And now on the other side, this is kind of going, and this, this statement itself has even become, I would say, um, controversial, <laughs> even though in the past I would have thought it was a, a simple statement, it has become a little bit controversial, is what does it mean to be a good man? <laughs> um, but to be a good man, I, I think, you know, it, one, you have to have a good heart, I, I guess, to, to you know, uh, a man who takes responsibilities for, for his actions, either positive or negative, you know, not not shifting the blame, but saying, look, hey, that was me. I did it. And I accept responsibility again, if it's positive or negative. Uh, also, a good man is somebody who who wants good things to happen for his family, for those in and around his, his sphere of influence, you know, who treats people like like, you know, the old adage says, treat people like you want to be treated. The golden rule. A good man, he, he emulates that. That is the, he, he treats people the way he wants to be treated. He knows that, look, you reap what you sow. So, um, and also I believe a good man, he's an intentional, intentional about what he does because when you're a good man, people are going to flock to you. It's like the Bible says, a good name is to be chosen rather than riches and gold, you know? So when you have a good name, when you're a good person, people are going to see it and they're going to want to flock to you or want to be around you. And so a good man is also intentional and realizes that because of the nature of who he is, he has other people watching him and he wants to make sure that he's leading a good example. Okay. Okay. One of the things um, that I wanted to, uh, to bring up um, just, I'm going to just uh, read a little bit of uh, statistics um, of what is going on out there for um, those that, that don't know um, 
what has been uh, coming up about the masculinity um, crisis is that um, right now, um, in uh, when it comes to the school years, um, boys are currently being outperformed by um, by women. Um, in uh, most uh, colleges, more women are, are starting to attend more colleges than women, and women's education attainment is uh, increasingly lagging behind. Um, in uh, in regards to the United States, um, men commit 90% of homicides in the United States and represent 77% uh, of homicide victims. Um, the group of men are the most at risk of being uh, victimized by violent crime. Um, they're 3.5 times uh, more likely than women to commit suicide. And um, this has been going on for a long time. A lot of people already know that uh, men tend to live shorter than uh, women. Um, and then uh, one of the other things that is happening, um, and I don't know if it's going to increase. We uh, everything, of course, has become unpredictable about who how the future is going to be after this pandemic. But um, with the uh, technology and um, uh, things changing uh, rapidly in society. Most of the type of um, jobs or professions um, are leaning more and more towards uh, a reliance on uh, social interactions and social intelligence. Um, and historically, um, and this would probably get me in trouble because people would be like, no, these days, but historically, <laughs> um, social intelligence um, was more of a, um, on a, uh, a feminine side uh, predominantly um, than it was predominantly male before. Um, and so one of the things that is happening to men is uh, economically, they are experiencing um, extreme stresses. And uh, in some cases um, that they used to be uh, a good amount breadwinners, it's becoming less and less and women are becoming more dom dominant in the workplace because of the changes of how um, work has changed to be more, social, emotional, intelligence um, uh, type of work. Um, and so with that, I guess, how, I guess, how would you say that men can cope with these um, changing um, uh, nuances out um, in the world economically? Um, I would say, you know, one, I, men are, are, are flexible. Uh, we tend to I guess be able to to rebound and, and, and get back up when one we have something worth worth fighting for, you know. So I would challenge men: What is their why? Why are they waking up every morning to go to work? Why? What is their motivation? You know, is it I want to save up enough money to get this brand new car? Is it I want to be the best father for my children? Uh, is it hey, I just need to, to to wake up to go to work? so I can barely pay the bills so our family can survive, so we can start all over again. So I would ask men to understand their why because their why will drive their passion. Their why will, will, will help motivate them. So when you're looking at uh, some of the economic factors and women rising to the, to the forefront because of the social uh, in, intelligence and so forth, and just uh, like the, some of the stats you mentioned, I would say, okay, you know, why, why do you want to do it, right? Why, why do you want to rise up? What is your why? And when you understand that, okay, let's go out and get it. Let's go out and grind. Let's go out and be who you've been called to be. And so that might mean taking some evening classes. That might mean, uh, you know, doing whatever it needs to do so you, so you can get ahead and, and also understanding the role. You know, in, in my household for quite some time, my wife was making more than me for a while because her education, as you mentioned, she had more education than I did. She graduated with two degrees, you know, and at that point I hadn't graduated college yet. And so having to understand the role, it's OK to uh, have a wife who makes more than you. And that doesn't deteriorate or it's not a, a, a hit against your manhood. It's whatever works for you and your family. You are both are, are bringing their your role. You're bringing your resources. You're bringing your talents, your time, and coming together to make a family. And so uh, we can't let the the stereotypical ideas that was around in the 50s, 60s, 30s, 40s for for various reasons. We have to make sure that we're parenting and that we're walking in the time of today's generation with some of these ideologies. And so it's whatever works best for for the family. So I would tell that that dad, that man, um, it's okay. 
You know, it's okay. I understand your why. And if your why is, is strong enough, you're going to find ways to make it work. Being working two jobs, working three jobs, uh, at the same time still balancing and understanding uh, that you, you're needed for your family. If that father needs to get an extra job or needs to go to class, go back to school at night while he's working overnight or while he's working during the day. He has to, only, he has to understand it's only for a season. These seasonal uh, temporary struggles or these temporary you know, things that you add on your plate is only for a season because he understands his why and he knows where he wants to go. So if men can have a goal and if they can understand their why, I think that can help them in the overall scheme of things, seeing things a little bit clearer. Okay. That sounds exactly um, what I've, I've heard is that you definitely, uh, you know, you need to have a goal and um, be able to be pushing for something um, as your uh, inner, inner motivation. Yes. Um, and so one of the things, of course, is that you mentioned um, earlier is that um, kind of what I've called the uh, trickle down effect is like uh, the grandparent to the father to um, you know, to the, the son, um, how would you say as a society, um, that we have, um, or are starting to, or have been failing our, our young boys? Um, good question. Uh, as, a, as a society, I believe we're, we're failing our young boys and not one, not presenting the full picture. Uh, you know, not sometimes we as parents or we, let's just talk about parents, for example. Sometimes we try to hold back the truth of the matter in thinking that we're doing our, our, our child good when it's really harming them. And so making sure that we're presenting our young boys with a full picture. Um, understand, let's just take athletics, for example. A lot of young boys are, are athletic or they have dreams of becoming professionals, but um, not everybody's gonna make it to the pro level. And so you might start off in Little League wanting to be a pro baseball player, but you know, there's a lot of work, a lot of work that comes in, in, into that as well. So understanding, okay, look, this is your goal. This is what you want to do, but here's the real picture, right? Here, here's what the reality says, not, not, di not diminishing your goal. So you have to work, 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 work. At the same time, what is your second plan? What is your other career or what are you going to do after you retire if you do make it? So making sure that the child is balanced, making sure that our boys are balanced. That's something our society has not always done. We tend to, to uh, pay attention to one area, be it music, be it sports, and, um, and, and skipping over. Our boys need to make sure that they're socially, emotionally healthy. You know, a lot of times, again, as I mentioned, we tell our boys, I suck it up, don't cry, it's going to be okay. We at the same time, so, and then later on, when that young boy grows up, we're, angry, we're upset at him because the only way he can experience his, his emotions is through anger, and then we're penalizing these young men because we, as a society, says, Men can show anger, but they can't cry. Men can't be emotional, you know, so we're sending mixed messages. So if we present, if a society tells the full picture with these young boys, present the, the accurate story, I think that's one way we can help our young men succeed. Another way is, I think we're failing our young boys, is not addressing the double standards in the community. You know, sometimes it's it's okay for some people in leadership to treat women a certain way uh, without any consequences, and then someone else uh, they, they get the consequence and the, it, the hammer comes down on them hard, you know, that's not okay. And we need to address that and speak to that. You know, it might be okay for some people to sell drugs or alcohol or, you know, do whatever, it's something illegal. And then the other person gets caught or it's, again, we're saying it's not right for that person, but person A can do it, you know? So these double standards, um, needs to be addressed, you know, uh, teaching our children right from wrong, teaching our young boys right from wrong. And not only, telling them what to do, but showing them what to do. So a lot of times we, mm -hmm. we, we, we have these expectations that our young boys should live up to, but one, are the expectations realistic? And two, are they seeing somebody in their community walk out these expectations as well? So not just do as I say, no, it's do what I do as well. So if I'm if as a father or as a leader in society, if I'm going to have an expectation for the, my young boys, then guess what? They need to see me walk that same expectation out as well. Yes, as you talked about um, double standards, and I think um, that is uh, one of the, the biggest things that um, uh, 2020 um, really showed us 
Um, do you think that uh, when it comes to masculinity and fatherhood, are there um, differences or uh, are they, it's, is it defined differently across uh, racial lines? Um, I would say yes and, and, and no. You know, I think uh, across racial lines, be, a father is a father and a man is a man. You know, I think uh, our children, no matter what they look like, whether they're black, white, blue, green, essentially our children need the same thing from the parents. They need the same thing from their fathers. Culturally, it may look different. Culturally, based off where they're born, who they are, the, the, the different cultures within that, that family, it might look a little different, but our children need the same thing, you know, from, from their, their, their family. So, but I, but I also believe society puts parameters and expectations of what masculinity looks like from a particular race, you know? And so a lot of times the parameters that are put in place are, are stereotypes, you know, stereotypes that are out there that says this race treats their, their, their children a certain way. This race does something different with their children. So I, 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 in answer to your question, I think along with masculinity and fatherhood, every race, every child needs the same thing for the, from their father, but it's the parameter and the lenses that society puts on those racial uh, uh, constructs that, 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 that shows the difference. Okay. Um, so in that, for uh, I'm going to take that um, for that each role in a child's life is different. So what is the key role does a father play in raising a child that's different because society has made it seem that it doesn't even matter now if you're the mother or father, um, you know, just as somebody's there, it's good enough. Um, but um, I'm going to uh, lean to the fact that it takes two to make this child. So there has to be a difference. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. I, I mean, fathers are amazing. Let me, let me backtrack a little bit. Mothers are exceptional. Mothers are amazing. Uh, and at the same time, Dads and fathers are amazing too. A lot of times our society downplays the roles of fathers or makes fathers feel less than because mothers are celebrated so much. Moms should be celebrated without saying. The father should also be celebrated. You know, when a father is involved in the life of his child, his child is gonna do better across most societal issues in life. You know, children are more likely to, to make A's and B's in, in school, more likely to get A's on the standardized, standardized tests less likely, likely to be involved in risky behavior and the, and the research goes on and on. So one thing that a father does differently than, than a mother is, um, for example, he, he, he roughhouses. A dad can roughhouse with this child, be it his toddler, be it his, his young adolescent child, you know, and, and that's okay, you know, we're, because that teaches limits. That teaches security. You know, if, if a child takes it too far, dad, trust me, <laughs> dad's going to let them know, hey, hey, oh, OK, the time out, time out. Right. Just in, inherently that that shows the child limits and it shows, OK, barriers. And I mean, not barriers, but boundaries that I can go with my father. You know, uh, even with moms and dads, they parent differently in the aspect of fathers tend to let their children explore more, explore the, the world and their environment around them, whereas mothers will tend to kind of be a um, month their children a little bit closer. What am I, what I mean by that? Well, let's say that a mother's at a park with her child and talking to the family or talking to somebody else, you know, she's going to want to be kind of close by that child's on the swing or sliding down the slide, you know, dad, as whereas on the other hand, he'll let the child venture a little bit further. Yeah. He's still watching the child, but he also maybe won't be as fast when the child maybe trips over a rock. You know, he'll walk over to make sure he's OK, but want to make sure that the child is experiencing things as well. So mothers and fathers parent differently. I agree that if, if, if dad is not in the picture, the child can, be, you know, will turn out. Hopefully if the village rallies around the child. The child will be just fine. But when fathers are involved and in the picture, raising a child with mom, that show that child is going to reach its full potential. You know, I, I guarantee you. So. Uh, fathers are important and they do parent differently. It, it, it's like peanut butter and jelly. Mom may have the jelly uh, uh, of the sandwich. Dad may have the peanut butter. It's two different things. When you put it together, it makes a beautiful sandwich. And as a matter of fact, I had one last night, you know, so <laughs> peanut butter and jelly is good. Mom and dad, they, they're two different ways of parenting. They come together to complement one another so well. 
What would you say is the greatest challenge um, fathers face? Um, the greatest challenge that fathers face, I would say, I mean, if I had the greatest challenge, uh, I would say the perceived, the, depre the, the depreciating factor of the father, the perceived de depreciation factor that the, the value is not important. Uh, it's kind of like what I was saying earlier that, you know, fathers are important, but sometimes society says they're not. For example, I remember um, going to my daughter. My daughter is now 12 years old, and I've been with my wife for 21 years now. And, and so I've been there from day one in the prenatal visits, in the doctor's offices and so forth. As I walked into the doctor's offices many times, the doctor would expect the information about how my daughter is doing to come from mom. Mom, how are things going? Mom, are there any new things that we should know about? Mom, what are some things that you're noticing? And yet they ignore the fact that, one, I'm there. They ignore the fact that I'm also a reliable expert on my child. So by their silence or by their, them not engaging me in the conversation, what it's telling me is that I don't matter and that mom is important. Mom is what, what you know, is who we should rely on. Forget what dad says, even if dad does say something, mom, what do you think about that, right? So mom is the expert. Whether fathers realize this or not, it, it does something to our confidence level. It, and so by that, that, by that nature, it is depreciating our value. Same thing with school conferences, parent-teacher conferences. If dad takes time to be off at a parent-teacher conference or back to school night, you know, then include both mom and dad in the conversation. You know, because I, I'm, because as a father by nature, I've taken off my job to be there. It shows that I care. It shows that I'm very concerned about the education of my child. So include me in the conversation. Pull me in by asking me questions as well. Hey, mom, thank you for that. Dad, what are your thoughts on that, right? When we do, when we, society doesn't do that, it depreciates our value by way, then our confidence as a father is lowered. And when we as a father, as men, when our confidence is lowered, we're not going to step up and do, to do some of the things at home because we don't think we can do it well. Why? Because society says that we don't matter. And then sometimes well-meaning moms, well-meaning grandmas will kind of push us out of the room and say, you know what? You don't need to change the diaper. Go ahead and hang with the men. Go hang with the boys. This is women. We got this. No, I want to be around my child. I want to make sure I'm changing diapers too. Right? So we have what's called maternal gatekeeping. Meaning, if you want to have access to the child, you have to enter to, in, through the maternal gate, that you have to come through mom or abuela or the grandma or the auntie, whoever it may be. So those factors right there depreciates the value of the role of the father and the eyesight of the father himself, but also for those around watching. So I think that's one of the greatest challenges that men face. Yes, as you mentioned that, you know, I, I started thinking about um, uh, I just had a, a baby last year and um, and um, yeah, you're you're exactly right. Everything is always focused on me um, when I go to uh, these uh, the doctor's visits and um, and and pretty much everything in life <laughs> and my husband <laughs> and my husband, you know, everything he, he even comes to me sometimes like, Oh, you know, what should we do for this, this? And I'm like, goodness gracious. Like I, how many times, like, do I have to be like, you know, constantly the person to answer everything? Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, no, you're, you're right. You know, and I, you know, and it's, um, it happens just so, um, you know, so not even, you don't have a, it's, uh, happening, um, subconsciously, you don't even realize all that stuff, um, just because, you know, society has just made it, uh, you know, standardized. Um, but yeah, that you bring up a, a very valid point. And now I guess, you know, I'm going to start including my husband a little bit more. <laughs> good, good. Uh, um, let's see here. Uh, one of the other things, um, uh, that I was just impressed, um, by you about is that you, um, help men, uh, learn to be, uh, good fathers. So, um, I guess just give me, uh, some of the ways that you guide uh, men to be good fathers? Uh, sure. S some of the way that just helping men be become good fathers is one, is when the dad can ask himself some questions. You know, the dad saying, you know, what type of father do I want to be, right? Because a lot of times we step into the role of mothering and fathering. And sometimes, to be honest, we may not be prepared, 
a lot of times people, you know, like my, my wife and myself, we were wanting a daughter. We had planned for a daughter. We were trying to have a baby. And, you know, there we experienced miscarriages along the way. But uh, glory to God, we, we were able to have one. And so sometimes it's a planned pregnancy. Sometimes it's not. The point I'm getting at is that we have to ask ourselves, what type of parent do I want to be? So I tell dads, hey, dad, what type of father do you want to be? And I have dads think about that because they think about, well, I want to be involved or I want to be present or, I, you know, they have to actually have an answer. Right. And, and wait for fathers to respond or I have them write it down. And then I ask them, OK, well, are you currently there? Right. If you were to grade yourself from A to, you know, to F, what would you what grade would you give you yourself based off what you wanted to be? And so I shared that I, I shared this with teen fathers one time and I graded myself. I said, you know what? I want to be a father that's involved. A father that's approachable. That was what I said. But then when I gave myself a grade, I had to be honest, and I gave myself a C. This kind of average. Why? Because sometimes I would be on my phone checking social media, on my phone doing some work, uh, and my, my daughter would approach me. I would say, hang on, baby girl. I'll, I'll be with you in a second. And sometimes I would get back to her. Sometimes I wouldn't. But what it showed me was, my in my daughter's eyes, maybe my phone and what I was doing was more important than her. So I had to, to, to correct that habit and then be able to, one, put my phone down when she comes to ask me a question and say, hey, listen, let me finish this real quick. I'll be right with you and hold myself to that. Be real quick, put it down, and then give my daughter the undivided attention that she deserves. So I asked fathers, what type of father do you want to be? What type of father did you have growing up? Right? Because in order for us to, to, to be the best men and fathers, sometimes we have to take a step back and look at our history. It was there there. Was he not there? What did you like about the way that, that your father raised you? What could he have done differently? Now, granted, we can, uh, the, the, the um, hindsight is twenty twenty, so we can always look back and find fault. And But we have to realize now as adults, our fathers and our parents did the best they could with what they had. So what are some positive memories that we have about our father? What are some negatives? What did you like about the positive memory? How can you recreate that memory in your life? For example, when I when I did that with again, just introspectively making sure that I'm doing that, I remember that my father, he would wake up early in the morning and make us breakfast. The pancakes would be so huge that they were falling off the plate. And sometimes he would make us like oatmeal or malto meal back in the day, right? And he would fill up the bowl so high it was almost overflowing. But those were great memories. And I had to say, Derek, why are you, why are you thinking about that? Why was it such a great memory? Because my dad did it for me. And you know what? When I looked further, that was one way that my father told me that he loved me because he wanted to cook for me. He wanted to make sure I was full. He didn't always say verbally at that time that he loved me. But looking back, those actions showed me that he loved me. So when I tell fathers, look back, what are some positive memories? What did you like about that? How can you recreate some of those memories for your children? Right. And also I ask them, who's mentoring you? Who is, who is your fatherhood mentor? Do you have somebody speaking into your life? I, I often share with fathers, look, who is your favorite actor? They might say it might be Denzel, right? I might say, who's your favorite athlete? It might be Michael Jordan. Okay, great. I know these two are older references, but still, it, it works. And I tell them, mm -hmm. Look, Michael Jordan and Denzel Washington, they both have coaches. Michael Jordan had a great coach in Phil Jackson. Denzel Washington, he has acting coaches. These two were at the top of their game, Denzel still is, at the top of their game, but yet they had somebody to speak into their life. What does that say about us as men? We too should also have somebody to speak into our life. So a, a fatherhood mentor, somebody that, that, we, that we can listen to uh, that has a little bit more wisdom. And then dad, what fatherhood books are you reading? What are you watching? What's the self-help that you're doing? Because let's say that you that dad wants to know how to fix his car that or that dad wants to you know plan a trip to go somewhere and go go from texas to michigan well he needs to look up how to, the route if you want to have a goal in mind sometimes you want to know how to get there so dad if your goal is to be the best father you can be sometimes it helps in researching and studying and, and putting more into you as you pour out to your children filling your cup back up so these are just a few things that i share with fathers about how to make sure that we're guiding men to be the best fathers their children need. Why? Because their children, they're worth it. 
Fantastic. Yeah, I like having like a, a definitely taking the approach of um, having a coach or a mentor. Um, you know, uh, one of the things obviously that is happening is that men feel alone. Uh, so having somebody that is there with you um, is an excellent idea. And I think um, uh, every dad should implement that. Uh, and so one of the things, though, before jumping into having uh, children, um, how does someone know that they're ready to be a father? <laughs> <laughs> is that a trick? That's a, that's a kind of a trick question. Yeah. Uh, how does someone know they're ready to be a dad? Well, I mean, um, it's tough, you know, because I've heard many times, you know what? I'm not ready to be a dad. I'm not ready to be a father. And sometimes you hear that excuse. Well, you know what, baby, your dad left because he wasn't ready to be a dad. And so that's a very real, uh, real valid statement. Um, I, I think men will know they're ready, ready to be a father when that dad is ready to love someone more than he loves himself. You know, if that dad is ready to love someone, then he, he loves himself. I think that's a good indicator that he's ready because sometimes you know, we can be just as men and as people in general, but as men, we can be selfish. We can be very idealistic and things, everything's about me. And especially the age that we live in, you know, it's about me, I this, I that. But, you know, being a man of faith, I refer to a scripture that says, that greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for a friend. And so when that father, that man who say, you know what, I'm ready to be a father. Why? Because I can lay down my life for my family, for my child, for my partner, for my, my girl, for my wife, whoever it might be. Laying down doesn't mean to actually dying. It does in some regards, but sacrificing your goals, your dreams, or putting them putting them on hold just for a second, right? It's not about me. For example, are you ready to uh, put spend money on diapers and formula or baby clothes versus and get those brand new shoes that just came out, right? Can you able to do that? Are you able to be good with that if you do that, right? Or are you going to have an attitude, man, I got No. So when dads can be able to love someone more than they love themselves, I think they're on a, a great track uh, and trajectory into, you know, being the father that that are you know a good father for his his children. That's a great answer. Um, what can what do you think that women can do to support men? Um, women, I think women one can can. Praise, praise men a little bit more. Not, you know, not saying that <laughs> uh -huh. no, men are, are super and men are awesome, but, but just it, be genuine about the work that men do. Uh, and when I say praise, like, what I really mean is encouraging us as men, encouraging us as fathers. You know, we don't, this, we don't need the, um, we're, we don't need the patronizing pat on the back. Say, oh, great, Jimmy, good job. No, right? <laughs> yes. but in the uh -huh. moment, you know, hey, I like the way you did that. I appreciate you. I mean, I know that took a lot for you to do that. I just want to acknowledge that. Oh, well, okay. May catch the dad or may catch that man off guard, but, you know, he'll really value it when it's genuine. So encouraging and, and supporting uh, men, I think that's good, you know, for, for women to do to help support men. I also, I, I think, um, now it might, it might be hard, but even with moms, when that father is there, when uh, mom and dad are fathering, mom, women, avoid gatekeeping avoid saying okay well honey that's not the way i would do it so your way is wrong this is the right way because this is the way i'm going to do it no if dad is trying let dad try let us try and fail right and then also celebrate our failures you know um i remember when i was my wife was pregnant and i had i wasn't a, mm -hmm. I'm not a great cook now i'm better but back then I was horrible. <laughs> uh -huh. And so I went to our local grocery store and they had a cooking demonstration going on. And I saw what they were doing in the grocery store. I said, hmm, this seems easy enough. Let me cook this for my wife who's pregnant at home. And because I went out to get, a, get some things. So as I was fixing things on the stove, I didn't put enough oil in the pan. I was making some what's called a fideo and I ended up burning stuff. And, and the, the smoke alarm came on. My wife is in the bedroom trying to rest. She says, honey, is everything OK? I said, yes, babe, go back to sleep. We're fine. At, well, at the same time, I'm fanning, the, I'm fanning the smoke detector to get it from, you know, stopping uh, the alarm and so forth. But I failed miserably. But my wife was grateful that I tried. Sometimes 
women, we may not do it the exact way that you would do it. We may not parent the exact way that you would parent, but applaud our effort. At least we're trying. I can recall a time when I was doing my daughter's hair. One of her ponytails was near her ear. The other one was on top of her head. And she was looking... <laughs> Uh, sorry about that. She was looking at it messed up, but at, at the same time, the effort was there. I was getting the effort, and as long as dad is trying, so allow us to try, allow us to fail, because we can't get better if we're not trying. Um, I would also say, for don't treat us like little boys. Don't treat men like little boys. Let us let us uh, have the space to to be men. You know, um, I would also say, you know, we can't read minds. So if you want us as men to do something, <laughs> share it with us. You know, that, that'll help support us, right? Share, share it with us so that way we can do better, um, you know, and, uh, and be okay. If you ask us for our opinions, be okay with the answer and the opinion that we get, you know? Uh, so I, I think that all that will help support men and for some of us into stepping in our role. Because get this, a lot of times, Women may be looking for us to step into our role, but this is going to be a tough statement. But sometimes we're just waiting for women to get out of our role. Okay. So it might be women had to step up traditionally because men were not in place. But if you have a man in your home that's trying to be the man that he needs to be, wife, young lady, uh, uh, missus, make sure that you slide over a little bit and stop trying to, 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 you know, just make sure that you shift over so dad, man, the husband can step into his role. So uh, allow us to be the, the fathers that we need. And, uh, and then the last thing I want to say, Anne Marie, is, is allow allow us as men to show you respect. Um, we mm -hmm. hear growing up or in songs that women, is they're disrespected. And I hear it in lyrics. It's, it's horrible. Some of the things that are said in movies, said behind closed doors, said in, in the, the music we listen to. But allow us to be, show you respect as well. You know, let's say if we're going to open a door for you, I know that women, I know your arms aren't broke. I know you can do, do it yourself. But allow us to, if, if a man's going to do that, allow him to do it without getting the attitude, because that's one way that we can show respect. Because when we're shut down, I, I can do this myself. I don't need you to open your, no door for me. Well, then you're, then you're, you know, we stepped out there to show something and get out of our comfort zone, so to speak. But now you're you're berating us because we try to be respectful. So now I'm going to go back in my shell and I'm going to be introvert uh, like I was before. So those are just a few things. I love women. Uh, I love my wife. Put it that way. I love women who, who who are you know who are out there. Women and men are great people. But I think those are some things that can help in supporting men across our culture. That's. Yeah, I've heard I've heard a lot of that. It's just uh, a lot of women, they have a, a tough time now, um, uh, you know, letting men uh, just be, be, just be, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just end it there. <laughs> just be. <laughs> um, so I guess to uh, kind of wrap things up, um, uh, I'll let you kind of do a, either a two part kind of a question here. What would you say that men um, need to be successful, and what uh, is uh, what makes being a man difficult today? Okay, um, what do we as men need to be successful? Mm -hmm. I would say it's it's very simple. You know, I would say it's truly just support and encouragement. You know, support and encouragement. Uh, I have a business that, you know, as as you mentioned in the intro, I do work for a nonprofit organization and I also run a business um, in the evening on the, on the weekends. And the support I get from my, my wife helps me to be able to be the best I can be, helps me to be able to wear the hats that I wear because I have her backing. I have her, her support. When I come home, she understands. I'm not getting fussed at. I'm not getting griped at, you know, and we're making sure that we're intentional about our family time and that also that I'm balancing our time as well. So the support I get helps me to be successful. I think every man and every family, mom and dad, husband and wife can define their own level of success. So whatever that looks like, if society, if your sphere of influence, if your family supports you, I think that man is going to be successful and also the encouragement to encourage men when they get down, to encourage fathers when they get down. Hey, you know what? It's all right. 
I've been through this. It, it's, it's tough, but you know what? You're going to get through it. You still have breath in your body. You can get back up again. What can you learn from this mistake? I know you made a mistake, but that's, it happens. But what can you learn from this? How can we get back on there and get back out there in the game? So support and encouragement, I think, is very important. And then I think the last question you asked me was about, um, I, I think about what we What makes, what's the difficult part of being a man in uh, today's yes. world? Mm -hmm. um, I think the difficult part about being a man in today's world is, is just the, the expectations, you know, the expectations that, that we are, where the bar is set. You know, we, we set the bar so high uh, and then um, we're, we're expected to be perfect, you know. Uh, we On social media, uh, we have, you know, we're only show the best parts of ourselves. The, a, uh, my family just went on a vacation and this is, this is um, what we did. We're showing, okay, this is my child. We're showing the best parts. No one is showing their, their worst moments on social media. We're all, you know, showing our best parts. So it's that pressure that that we're um, that we're trying to live up to, you know, that that we that we've set. So I think it's trying to be strong, right? It's trying to be strong all the time, you know, and at the same time we know that's impossible. But we say real men, hey, real men are supposed to be it's supposed to be tough. We're supposed to be strong. Not all at all times. Even Superman has a weakness, right? Even Popeye had a weakness. There are times that those superheroes they get down. So as a, a society, um, there's moments that we get down, and it's okay to to help unpack the trauma that we go through, or the hurts that we go through, or the stresses we go through, to give us time to talk about it. So one of the greatest challenges, or what what's difficult, is trying to be strong at all times when it's impossible. So giving grace for men to be vulnerable, I think that is something that doesn't happen in society. Women can be vulnerable. But at the same time, men can be vulnerable too. But if men are vulnerable, then sometimes society sees that as a sign of weakness. It's not. When I'm able to be vulnerable with other men and say, hey, man, I'm hurt, dude, that really shows strength. And so it's difficult to be strong all the time. No one can be strong all the time. Allow us as men the grace to be vulnerable and be okay with that. I love that answer. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, thank you, Derek, for your time and insight. Um, if you would like to learn more about Derek, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is it the best to go to bryantenterprises.com? Yes, ma'am, bryant-enterprises.com. Okay, well, fantastic. And so if you have a passion for an unserved community, a social justice issue, or simply want to change minds, contact Project Good Work at projectgood.work to start your project of change today. Thank you to our listeners. Thanks for tuning in to Project Good. We're focused on what matters. Oh,